It's hard to imagine today, but there was a time when humans had to live without calculus. They had no derivatives, differential equations, or limits to keep them company on a nice summer day. Luckily, this period of incomprehensible sadness came to an end in the 17th century, but it didn't happen overnight. Mathematicians have long debated whether theorems, proofs, and other mathematical things are invented or discovered. The first stepping stone towards the discovery or invention of calculus takes us to ancient Greece. The Greeks used what is called the method of exhaustion to find the area of a circle. This process of making closer and closer approximations lies at the heart of calculus. But sadly, the Greeks' age of learning was cut short. One of the last great Greek mathematicians before the rise of Rome was Archimedes of Syracuse. Archimedes continued to study the method of exhaustion used by the ancient Greeks, but Archimedes took the method further than his contemporaries, using infinitesimals to approximate the area and volume of geometric surfaces. Unfortunately, the Roman conquerors and the eventual collapse of their empire would put a halt to the early mathematical advances of the Greeks. For the next few centuries, little advances were made in mathematics, but after centuries of stagnation, scientific progress resurged. In the 14th century, the mean speed theorem was proved by a group of English mathematicians known as the Oxford Calculators, along with some French collaborators. This theorem dealt with continuity and distance, but more importantly, it marked a turning point in European history. The 17th century marked the beginning of an age of enlightenment. Humans began to question the world around them and to rely on their own senses to explain their observations. During this time period, European mathematicians first began to discuss the concept of a derivative. One of these mathematicians was Pierre de Fermé, who found a method of obtaining, obtaining the maximum and minimum values of functions that was extremely similar to differentiation. Many other mathematicians, such as Blaise Pascal, contributed to the advances made during this century and led to the discovery of calculus. Although ancient mathematicians and European mathematicians during the Age of Enlightenment were using methods that were very similar to calculus, no one had formally defined the subject. The credit for the formal invention or discovery of calculus belongs to two people. Although Isaac Newton made his discoveries first, Gottfried Leibniz had the same findings 10 years after Newton. F Leibniz made his findings independent of Newton, so credit is given to him, as well as Newton, for the discovery of calculus. Although Newton and Leibniz arrived at the same conclusions, their methods were very different. Newton discovered calculus through his studies of physics and the natural order of the world. As such, he viewed calculus in physical terms, as motions and magnitudes. Newton used calculus to explain the movements of real objects. Leibniz disagreed with Newton on the meaning of calculus. Leibniz discovered calculus by trying to find the tangent of a curve. This had been a popular exercise for mathematicians for centuries, but Leibniz was able to create a formal method for finding the tangents by using calculus. Rather than seeing calculus as a model of the universe like Newton, Leibniz saw it as a divine explanation of change. The biggest difference between the methods of Newton and Leibniz is the notation. Now, Leibniz's notation is more commonly used, dy, dx, etc. But Newton's notation was made in an attempt to make calculus easier for everyone to understand. So the next time that you're cursing the useless subject, remember that Isaac Newton thought it was important for everyone to understand calculus. Despite our difficulties with calculus, the world would be a much darker place without it.